Talmudim way, adding cultural, historic, and geographic significance to your walk as a disciple of Jesus. In this video, we want to look at the background of the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is two words in Hebrew, Beit Lechem, and that means house of. Beit is house of. Lechem is bread, so we get house of bread. And we'll find that there are many wheat and barley fields in this area, and most notably, we see that in the book of Ruth, and we'll get into that as we work through this. So you can see on the inset satellite map, Bethlehem's pretty much right in the center of the country. What people aren't um, necessarily aware of is how close it is to Jerusalem. It's only about six miles south of Jerusalem. So you have Jerusalem up here, Bethlehem is down here. It seems far on this map, but it's only about six miles apart. As we mentioned, a heavily a farming area at one time. Now it's a mod more of a modern city, but back in the day it had grain fields, and then you have uh, sheep and goats grazing on the hillsides. And while that is still present, uh, there is a city of about 30,000 um, mostly uh, Arab Muslims and Arab Christians there today. Because it's right on the edge, so right along here would be where the Judean desert is. And so on the other side, you see that there's very few cities. Um, there's some streams. Most of those are dry, but it's just not a place that's very um, habitable. Whereas if you look on the west side of that line, you have all of the cities in the uh, in the hill country. Um, this area, this edge area, is great for shepherding. You wouldn't want sheep and goats feeding on, on the same wheat and barley fields used for human foods. But um, right on the outskirts of town, you have this where the terrain changes a little bit. And it gets uh, hillier and it, it's really good for, uh, for shepherding. So we'll note in Luke 2... He says the shepherds were in the region of Bethlehem. So they weren't in the city, but they were at some point they had to travel, you know, some unstated distance to get back into town. Today it is in the West Bank politically, but it's very safe. Thousands of Christians visit uh, the holy sites in Bethlehem each, you know, each month with no issues going back and forth. This is a better look at the aerial view of the modern city, and we're basically looking at this from the perspective of Jerusalem. So this road here is, is roughly the same road that is the way of the patriarch. So the road that Abraham took, the way that the road that Jacob took is the same road today, how you get from basically uh, Shechem in the north all the way down through Jerusalem and then all the way down to Hebron in the south. Here's a closer shot of the modern city, and you can see the terraced hillsides there that would be uh, used for, for shepherding. Here's a grove of olive trees in here. We believe Bethlehem was a small Canaanite village before uh, being uh, captured by the Israelites around 1400 B.C., very famous for the story of Ruth, which takes place in Bethlehem, and that leads to the birth of David, uh, who, again, just like Jesus, born in Bethlehem, but died in Jerusalem, and of course, both came to be kings. Today, as we mentioned, Bethlehem has an Arab population of about 30,000. Some sites to keep in mind as we work through uh, this lesson on Bethlehem. Rachel's tomb here commemorates the death of Rachel, which we'll look at um, on the next slide. And there's uh, some question of whether this is the actual location. There might have been another Bethlehem mentioned. The big deal, of course, for our purposes is the Church of the Nat Nativity, which is the very long-standing traditional location, strong traditional location of where Jesus was born. On the outskirts, you've got the shepherd's fields and what is a, a deep ravine, and some scholars speculate that this may have been the valley that David had in mind when he wrote Psalm 23. Of course, David was from this area, so he would have known this area very well. And then what I find fascinating is this place called Herodium, which was a man-made mountain by King Herod. It was one of his palaces. And so juxtaposed against the real king of the Jews being born in humility, you've got the, the man who was named king of the Jews, who wasn't even Jewish, uh, living in this palace at Herodium. So we'll unpack all this as we move through this lesson. One aspect of Bible study that's good to get uh, familiar with is what's called the law of first mention. And this is a, a line of thinking that goes the first time a town or a person or a concept is mentioned in scripture, it is usually quite significant. And so the first mention of Bethlehem occurs in Genesis 35. 
well, this is where uh, Jacob's wife Rachel dies and then was is described as being buried in Bethlehem. Verse uh, 35, verse 16, Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath, uh, Beth, Bethlehem, Ephrath. Uh, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. When her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you have another son. And her, as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called the son Benjamin, which is son of my right hand. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. So you can see a picture of the traditional location of Rachel's tomb. It's a holy spot uh, in Judaism, and they will they will visit her grave and, and mourn and, and, and pray. Um, what is interesting is that Todd Boland sees some difficulties with this location, because according to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 10, it says Rachel's tomb was located in Benjamin, and the tr traditional tomb that we're looking at here is located in Judah. Bethlehem is in Judah. So we have a potential trap there. Um, Nehemiah 7.26 indicates a settlement named Bethlehem is listed in Benjamin, so possibly this other site. Now, what's interesting is that another conservative scholar, Benjamin Foreman, has uh, answered Dr. Boland's uh, objections in, in a paper. And what I like about this is that they're both sound scholars. I've, I've quoted Benjamin Foreman before in my uh, geographic uh, studies. And um, it just shows you two people can look at the same thing and disagree, and they don't have to divide over it. It's we're, both, we're all Christians. We're looking at the same thing. We just have two different opinions, and that's okay. Bethlehem takes center stage in the book of Ruth. So our second uh, mention of Bethlehem comes in the book of Ruth, where we learn that Naomi is from Bethlehem. Because of a famine in, in Israel, her husband and her two sons moved to Moab, and they marry a couple of Moabite women, which they weren't supposed to do, interestingly enough. Uh, when the famine subsides, uh, by this time the husband and the two sons have died, Ruth and Naomi uh, go back to Bethlehem, and that's really where the story unfolds. So Ruth chapter 1, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the company of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malchon and Chilion. And so time goes by. Afterwards, they, they marry, the sons die, uh, Ruth chapter 1 verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, uh, returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And so this all takes place around the barley harvest. We now have Ruth gleaning in the fields and it was a law of the day that uh, the harvesters had to leave a corner of the field um, unharvested so the poor could come along and, and gather food to eat. And so that's what Ruth is doing there. So Ruth is very, very poor at this point. This is a, a, a poverty uh, alleviation program. Uh, Ruth chapter two, Naomi had a relative of hers, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. So Boaz, Boaz and Elimelech are related somehow. Uh, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain in whom whose sight, after him whose sight I shall find favor. So almost a word of prophecy there. She knew she was going to find favor in the eyes of Boaz. And Naomi said, go. And then chapter four really is the climax where um, there's a little bit of drama and tension going on in chapters uh, two and three. But it, ultimately, uh, Boaz takes Ruth, became his wife, and she, he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who, is this, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. And basically, uh, Obed was born of Ruth and Boaz. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. So this is our line and our connection that places King David in Bethlehem. So outside of Jesus, the most significant resident the town ever had would have been King David. Um, he was born in Bethlehem, and it's called the city of David for that reason. He grew up as a shepherd, and at that time, being a shepherd was lonely, boring. No one wanted the job. However, um, David put this time to good use. He learned to love the Lord 
and learned uh, the art of conflict militarily and uh, learned music and, and did all these things um, in his growing up years in Bethlehem. We believe many of the Psalms that David wrote would have had their roots in this area around Bethlehem, drawing from the geography. Um, notably, First Samuel 16, great chapter to read, is where David is anointed king. And this is where the Lord has rejected Saul. Samuel goes to Jesse, says, bring out your sons. Um, the Lord, you know, the, the tall, mighty one stands up in front. Surely the Lord's anointed is, is this one. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And then a key memory verse here, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so this leads Samuel to say, is, is this everyone? You know, are we sure we got everyone here? And then uh, Jesse says, well, there's, there's one more, my youngest, but behold, you know, he's out keeping the sheep. You know, are you sure you want him? Um, Samuel says, of course, stand and get him. We will not sit until he comes here. And so, of course, David is the one who is anointed king. And uh, verse 13 of 1 Samuel 16, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And what's interesting is what does he do after he's anointed king? He's right back in the field. So the next chapter is the story of David and Goliath. And there's this battle looming. And where do we find David? He's back uh, doing what he was supposed to be doing, tending uh, to his uh, his sheep. Uh, several other names in, in this era were noted to be in Bethlehem. Second uh, Samuel notes Joab, Abishai, and Ashael born in Bethlehem. Uh, one of Mighty's men, Elhanan, is referenced there in Second Samuel. Second Chronicles, it says that a king Rehoboam fortified Bethlehem, so it had some strategic interest. And then in the prophets, uh, we see uh, the name mentioned here and there. It was rebuilt after uh, the Babylon exile. Ezra and Nehemiah record that. What's most important, though, is, is we get to Micah 5.2, and this is where Bethlehem was named as the place of the Messiah's birth. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one is to, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old and from ancient days. So um, one thing that prophecy is not necessarily prediction and fulfillment as much as it is as pattern. So we had the, the greatest king of Israel, King David, born in Bethlehem. So naturally, of course, where else would the Messiah be born but the same hometown as King David? Um, so this is uh, Micah saying Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. Like I said in the introduction, very intriguing that you have this place called Herodium, which is just this, a stone's throw away from where Jesus was born. And this is uh, King Herod the Great, who was the king when Jesus was born. He built this massive palace slash fortress called the Herodian, or you might see it spelled Herodium. Both both are uh, the both are the same. Again, just outside of Bethlehem, it was built for his protection and glory. And what is interesting is that this sets up a struggle of the true king, Jesus, against the, the false usurping king, uh, King Herod, that we see emphasized in, right in the geography. So it's not just a, a political battle and a spiritual battle. It's also a geographic battle, if you want to call it that. You've, you've got these two kings very, very close to each other. We'll come back to uh, Herodium on the next, next few slides. So here's a shot looking down into the top of this man-made mountain. And basically he took dirt from another hill and built his own fortress. And so when Jesus says, if you have faith, you know, that can move mountains, um, Herod actually did this in his own strength. He actually created his own mountain. And so everything he wanted was big, um, ostentatious, calling attention to himself, a, a very much a symbol that he was in charge and it was his his power. Very much afraid militarily. So if you look in the picture, you can see walls, um, towers, uh, you know, lookout points. Basically, the place would have been impregnable militarily. Yet being Herod, he also wanted all of the creature comforts that Rome had. So bathhouses, uh, you know, luxury types of things there. And, and to pretend uh, <laughs> to give you know, lip service to being Jewish, uh, he had a there was a synagogue built on top. So in the inset picture you can see looking towards the back with the 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 synagogue in the uh, the upper uh, right corner of that picture inset so um 
he had these building projects all over the Holy Land. It's hard to separate uh, when when you visit there. Just heritage footprints are everywhere. So the uh, Masada is another place. Caesarea. He built a deep water harbor that was actually the biggest harbor of the empire for for a time up in Caesarea. He enlarged the Temple Mount and the, rebuilt the temple for the Jews. That was just massive in in glory, size, and beauty. Some people estimate it's three to five times bigger than the Dome of the Rock is today, if you want to get a sense of, of how big it is. And then he built this fortress here um, to keep a watchful eye over <laughs> over the area of uh, Judea. So again, he, he and this is the highest mountain in the region. <laughs> it's all man-made. It's kind of funny. Uh, he, he didn't hesitate to kill anyone who he viewed as a threat, and that includes his oldest son, whom he ordered beheaded. He had his wife uh, killed. He had people drowned in these pools. And so when these magi show up asking for him that is born king of the Jews, he, he doesn't hesitate to move into action. And verse 16 of Matthew 2 records that he sent and he killed all the male, had killed all the male children in Bethlehem uh, who were two years old and under. So we don't have any extra biblical proof of this uh, massacre, but uh, what we know about Herod is it's just entirely consistent with, with who he was and who he was afraid of. And again, there's this dig. He was, he was from uh, the, the line of Esau, not from the tribe, not from the line of Jacob. So he was not Jewish by birth. He was, he was a forced convert, and he's, he's really an idiomaean, which is kind of the traditional enemies of the Jews. And so you have this, you know, usurper king versus the true king, Jesus. Um, the Herodian was the third largest palace in the world at the time of Herod. I mean, so this, this place is just massive. And again, it's just monument, a, a monument to, you know, what he saw as his power. It rose among the landscape uh, on a clear day. I believe you can see it from Jerusalem. Um, it's 45 acres, uh, you know, in, in uh, surface area. And then at the base, it had a, a luxurious city with swimming pools, spa, theater, you know, all the luxuries. Um, had a, He had an aqueduct built that piped water in um, from a spring. So again, we're contrasting this, going into all this, just to contrast, you know, the, the person who was calling himself the king of the Jews versus the true king of the Jews, born just a couple of miles away in very lowly circumstances. Here you can see the area where there were just lavish pools and columns and, and opulence. And then the when they had to retreat to the fortress, it was right there behind them. So again, you, you can't help but notice the contrast between Herod, you know, the false king, the king of this world, and who only cared about building his earthly kingdom and who is now very dead. And in fact, the Herodium is, uh, is his burial place. You contrast that with Christ, who came as a servant, uh, came humble and lowly, but who, in fact, is the true king. Um, Isaiah 9 says, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be Wonderful Counselor. And so uh, of the increase in government and peace, there will be no end. So Herod was seeking all this, and yet it belongs to Jesus. John 8, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So the I am is basically Jesus saying he is God. He is the one in charge. Uh, another story, John 10, they picked up stones to stone him. He said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, it is not good. Uh, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being man, make yourself God. Now they're, of course, they're not entirely wrong uh, because he is making himself God. But if, if he weren't telling the truth, then he would be committing blasphemy. He's telling the truth because he is God. Um, Revelation 22, um, I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, beginning and the end. So Jesus is the true king, unlike Herod. So here's a shot of Bethlehem from the Herodium. And so I'm sure there's a zoom on the camera, but you can see they're just not that far apart. And so we, we have this contrast 
uh, right here in the geography of, of Herod, the false king, the king of this world, versus the king whose you know kingdom is not of this world. First John 2, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So it's just a, a check, you know, which are we more like? Are, are we living like King Herod? Are we saying we're, we're following Jesus, but we're living more like King Herod? Um, you know, are we going to follow the tendency to care about our own glory and our own kingdom? Uh, do we have a prideful attitude like Herod, or are we humble like Jesus? Uh, are we building our own kingdom, or are we, we working to build the kingdom of God? So all of these contrasts between Herod and Jesus are just kind of in your face when you think about the uh, the shadow of <laughs> uh, of the nativity story was you know in this mountain uh, called Herodium. And then as prophesied, as promised, Luke two and Matthew two. Uh, give us the uh, confirmation that Bethlehem is the birthplace of the Messiah as prophesied. And so it's interesting that af after Matthew 2, verse 18, there's no, and, and Luke 2, there's no mention of Bethlehem in the rest of the New Testament. All right, enough about Herod. Let's look at the shepherds now. So the shepherds were the first to hear the announcement of Jesus' birth. And it, as we've talked about, it's interesting that God chose shepherds because they were considered among the lowliest of, of people. To be a shepherd was to be a nobody. I mean, it was boring, a uh, lonely, despised job, you know, no one wanted. And, you know, first of all, uh, not the least of which is you smelled like sheep. You know, you, you would walk in and people would go, oh boy, I, we, know, we know what you do for a living. And so there would be, even the smell would drive people away from them. Um, Jesus, remember, he came to save all people, and he showed us in his ministry, in his life and death, his humility. And so the angels appeared to the shepherd really as a sign that this good news was available now for all. Even the lowliest shepherds um, could take advantage of the, the Messiah and salvation. So some questions, when we think about the lowliest among us, do you believe salvation is truly for everyone or are there winners and losers in this game? Um, are we humble like the shepherds were? They they went in haste, they dropped everything they were doing, went in haste to see Jesus. And so do we show that same zeal and fervor and, and our desire to be with him? So some questions to ask ourselves there. Now let's talk about the Church of the Nativity a little bit. In our Protestant tradition, we don't get too wrapped up in church buildings, but uh, that we're very much unlike the rest of, of Christendom. Um, a lot of people hold these buildings sacred and you know not hopefully not for what the building is but what happened there and so what's interesting is that in history pretty much right after jesus's ascension uh worshipers began marking the key places surround the surrounding the life and events of jesus and so we have namely the church of the holy sepulcher in jerusalem where he was crucified and uh and uh, you know and rose again uh probably the the most sacred spot in in all of christianity is is in jerusalem but then uh, the the birthplace was also uh, noted way way back so first century early on worshiping worshipers began uh, you know meeting at the site and then commemorating it as the birthplace of jesus and also uh, in a strange uh turnabout in 135 uh emperor hadrian uh, destroyed all of the Jewish and Christian sites, and he built shrines to false gods on top of them. He renamed Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina and banned Jews from entering the city. And so he's trying to wipe out, you know, this upstart Christianity religion and the, the longstanding Jewish religion. Um, on top of the birthplace, he erected a, sh a shrine to Adonis, who is the Greek god of beauty and desire. So he's absolutely desecrating these holy spots. And what he was trying to do was, you know, again, desecrate them, wipe them out. What uh, the, the, the new conqueror likes to you know, show to the people who were conquered is that our gods are better than your gods. Your gods are now vanquished. Our gods are still here. And so while he may have thought he was doing that, and maybe for a couple of hundred years, it, it looked to be that way. What he ended up doing was he was marking the site's location for future generations. So as a result, we are very confident 
confident that both the Holy Sepulchre and the, the Church of the Nativity are the historically accurate sites because they just have this mark go way, way back. Why would, you know, why would an enemy emperor go to such trouble to wipe out this spot if this wasn't the true spot? Justin Martyr, around 160 AD, also affirms that this is the true site. It was also commented by Origen and Eusebius in the 3rd century. Um, so while all this is under Roman rule and there's a Roman pagan shrine there, the believers are still remembering the place and, and passing it on. So when Constantine receives Christianity, receives Jesus as a savior, he sees a sign. The story goes, he sees a sign in the sky that says, in this sign, conquer. It's a whole another discussion, which we'll get into uh, some other day. Um, but basically on, on that after that, Christianity is not the official religion, but it's now basically decriminalized. So uh, we're not persecuting people for being Christian. Uh, his mother, Helena, made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and started to identify some of these sites. And so the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built along with the Church of the Nativity built here around. It was dedicated in 339 AD. She also went into the Sinai and um, marked the, the locations of, of Moses' travels and all that. So we need to remember that, you know, at this time of Helena, um, it had the, the area had been you know, destroyed and, and knocked down by Hadrian. And then in the subsequent years, uh, the, the Crusades and uh, the Muslim periods and the you know, British periods and, and all of that, you have fires, you know. So basically the, the place today looks nothing like what it would have back then, but that's just how holy sites go. They're just they're they're constantly changing, they're built upon. Um, and then as of today, there are several different denominations that claim ownership of the church. And, and so it's it's interesting, you have the same issue going on in, in the Holy Sepulchre today. Uh, again, Protestants don't you know, venerate church buildings the way other uh, members of our faith uh, do, but uh, it's a it's a big big deal to a lot of people uh, who who has control over the Church of the Nativity. What's notable about this is that this the entrance way you you have to bow down and and venerate the place, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's um, only about four feet high, <laughs> so it's called a door of humility. What what it really was was to prevent riders from entering on their horses and mules. So they had this kind of small door that's still there today. Here's a segment of the what we believe is the original mosaic floor dating back to the time of Queen Helena, 339. So you go there and, and you think, well, this looks nothing like a cave, but then you remember all of the destruction and the building and rebuilding. Um, there was strong tradition that Jesus was born in a cave. Again, Justin Martyr wrote that Jesus was born in the cave. Uh, some other documents uh, attest that the cave was a place of Jesus' birth. And this this really makes sense when we looked at it in our main study with the way houses were built. You see a picture on the inset there where oftentimes the cave would be the basement where you would you know, house the animals and uh, then you build the house around it. So many houses today in this area are still built in front of caves and uh, again, just provide uh, shelter for animals and, and that kind of thing. And then here is the, uh, the the spot alleging the actual location. It's a 14-pointed star with a nod to Matthew's uh, genealogy of 14 generations from Abraham to David, David to the exile, and then the exile to Jesus. The uh, star is inscribed with, in Latin, it says, Here of the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ was born. And these lamps around it, uh, there, there are 15 of them, and they burn day and night around the star. Six belong to Greek uh, Orthodox, five belong to Armenian, and four to Latin churches. So this tells you even the, the lamps, you know, different, uh, different churches are owning them. And again, we don't worship the place. Uh, we remember what happened here. So when you visit, this reminds you of the tremendous impact that uh, you know, this is a game changer. <laughs> this one birth changed the world. Hope you found this helpful, this little peek into Bethlehem. Um, hopefully someday we can all get there um, as part of a tour. 
But there is a great video that goes into a lot of this uh, and has some great commentary and teaching. It's called Following the Messiah. And I've got the link there to episode one where they're all talking about Bethlehem. So highly encourage this series. It's on YouTube. It's also on Right Now video if you have access to that. So some faith lessons as we uh, close out here. Remember, Bethlehem means house of bread, and Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life. So we feed our bodies daily, but we also need to be feeding ourselves spiritually on God's word and, and walking moment by moment um, in, in, his, uh, in his will. We, uh, you know, one thing about the church is that, you know, it's a church, it's a building, but what is important is what happened there. Um, it reminds us that Bethlehem was the fulfilling of prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. So there are over 300 prophecies regarding his first coming, um, probably more than that, but people have counted 300. And it was you know, this massive historic supernatural event. It proves that uh, Jesus is God. <laughs> he is the Son of God. His word is inspired. Um, everything about his detail uh, of his life, birth, death, he is who he claimed to be. And so our challenge is, do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Have, have we received him as our Lord and Savior for one? And then if, assuming we have, are we living our lives in that confidence? And that's one thing a trip to the Holy Land is, is just really good for shoring up the things that you know and the things that you've read, and then you see him in, in real life and in living color, and you realize that all of this is true, and it's just a great, uh, great experience. But again, until we can get there, we, we do have these lessons and tools available to us to see the historic background. So hope you found this interesting. Uh, we will uh, probably look at Nazareth next in our little series on this. And and until then, uh, we will see you on the next video. We hope you've enjoyed this lesson. For more information, find us on the web, www.talmudimway.org.